is to summarize what Dr. Bori did that. Hello, Alex here again. This is just a quick off-the-cuff video. I don't know if you know it or not. Well, you, you probably do if you're into 3D printing. But uh, Thomas Salander and uh, Stefan from CNC Kitchen have a dynamic duo podcast together where they both get together and talk about all things Bavarian, like beer and chocolate and chocolate beer and the latest Dirndl and Lederhosen trends. I'm kidding. They talk about 3D printing, but they're both near Bavaria. And... Um, they were talking about a paper that uh, Dr. Adrian Boyer posted, or I don't think it was a paper, it was just a post. He was trying to work toward what I would call a smart infill pattern, and I think this is a great idea. And it's not really a direction that I had thought of, but it's worth talking about, so hey, here we go, let's talk about it. And I'll give you um, what he said, and then I'll do like my take on it and kind of like a wish list for the future. The bottom line was he took a uh, beam and ran it as a cantilever, so it was secured at one end, and then put weights on the other to measure the deflection. What they're trying to achieve is deflection to weight ratio. So that is the stiffness of the material with respect to how much the, the, the thing weighs. So he was taking a cantilevered beam and then modeled that in FEM or FIA, whichever you want to say. I'll just say FEM because FIA is a weird thing to say. But uh, finite element modeling, you can use that to kind of maximize or, or uh, what, what do you say, optimize, I guess you could say, the shape of a thing to show where you should put more or stronger or denser or whatever materials and where it's less important. So obviously on a cantilever beam where it's secured, that's where it's most important that it be stiff or strong because that's going to be taking the most deflection, whereas at the end it's not nearly as important. So he would take that information, feed it into this script, which then made holes throughout the print that then when you printed it out, it would treat those voids as perimeters in the infill, thereby making stiffer sections. I very much agree with what he's trying to do here. It's the methodology that I'm a little meh with, but again, I see what he's, the ball he's trying to get rolling. So I'll give you my take on it here in a minute. I modeled all of this up. I dumped the uh, STL into Cura and I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about here. And then to the end, I'll talk a little bit about what we can do about that. Pardon any noise in the background. I have a fan running because I have some glue drying behind me. Sorry about that. If you're gonna be messing with this at home, first thing I recommend doing is going over to these three little bars here and then pick, uh, show all settings for Cura so you can get all the good stuff. First, we're gonna talk about normal options in Cura or whatever your slicer is and um, show you what you can do with what's already there, like manually, just if you're trying to increase strength in just one particular direction while saving weight at the same time. This is not like the crazy variable script stuff, but uh, this will let me build up from what's there to things that are available that aren't used for this that can be used for the subject we're talking about, and then on to you know, the wish list and that type of thing. And I use Cure just because that has a very pretty UI and I know these options pretty well, but uh, a lot of these apply to other slicers as well. And there's also, um, I th think, Simplify 3D and Slicer, Slicer, whatever, they have the option to alternate a solid level every X number of layers. So um, that's something that not, does not exist in Cura. It was requested, but uh, it's not something they seem to be interested in putting in there. So regardless, just be aware that that's an option in other slices as well. The first thing I'm going to do is just drag in a regular old cube and show you just the standard old fashioned grid infill type pattern. And it, you know, kind of explore what's going on here. And this is the familiar infill pattern that we all know and love, the grid. Now, the typical line directions for these, as in the angle that they're running with respect to the y-axis, is uh, 45 degrees and 135 degrees, as you can see right here if you mouse over. Now, the very basic thing we can do is go right here to infill line directions and change that angle to 90 degrees. And then if we go ahead and hit prepare, I'll fast forward through this stuff, I'll clip these shorter in the rest of the video. 
you can see that now instead of the infill patterns running at an angle, we have stiffness along the X and the Y direction, at, I mean, as well as the Z, because that's where it's going. Now here's another trick. You can go ahead over here to the infill line multiplier, change that to whatever, we'll just change it to two, and that's going to draw each of these little sections individually. So you have more or less like doubled infill lines. And like I said, they're all drawn individually. And this is what it ends up looking like, as you can see. Now let's show another option, toggle that back to one, and then move down here to extra infill wall count. And what that's going to do is going to give you an extra infill perimeter around the outside of the, uh, the infill pattern before you hit the wall. As you can see right here, if it'll render, let me chop that out. Here we go. Now, that's not exactly what we're looking for, but it's just I figured that feature sitting right there, so I'd show you about it. All right, so let's ditch that, and we'll say, okay, well, we're trying to only make something stiff in one direction and as light as possible, so let's change down here to lines from grid, and then go ahead and hit render. I keep saying render, I mean slice. But anyway, that's going to just give us lines in one direction. So that may or may not be something you want. Think of it like aircraft splines or something. And we can go ahead and change the infill line directions again to 180, and that's going to rotate the pattern the other direction so that in the y-axis we have all of our stiffness. And here's another trick. We can go ahead and change the infill density. Let's drop that down to like 10%, like really low, which is of course gonna look like this. Now, if we go back down, if you remember our infill line multiplier, let's go ahead and change that to like three. So what that's going to give us is far fewer, but very much thicker, well, three times thicker actually, infill lines. So, all right, groovy, but let's go ahead and look at some of our 3D infill patterns. First one we'll look at is uh, cubic subdivision, or yeah, cubic subdivision, we'll do that first which is gonna give us this. And as you can see, as I scroll up and down, it's essentially making three-dimensional voids in there, which is a lot along the lines of what Dr. Boyer was trying to do by embedding those you know, uh, cylindrical channels in there. Now, the purpose of these infill patterns is to give stiffness or strength in every direction, but we can use something like quarter cubic and then orient that pattern along the axis that we wanna stiffen up and then let me show you what that looks like. All right, now we're getting somewhere. You can kind of see where I'm building up to with this, but this obviously has much more control in just uh, perpendicular axes. So, you know, in this case, our X and our Y. And this is where we're getting into the features that I like to mess around with. Here are gradual infill steps. I'm gonna choose three, and then I'm gonna change the step height a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna make it a little bit taller so it'll be easier to see these transitions. And what this does is the closer you get to the roof, the denser the infill pattern gets. It just keeps subdividing more and more and more. So it goes from nothing to lines across just the half. And then we're going to double that up and double it up more as we get closer to the top. And let me up the infill density to 50% and I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit more extreme. So here we have a very sparse pattern on the bottom and I'm going to scroll up a little bit here and try to find the point right where it doubles. Yeah, there we go. Right there, it's going to double. And then as we get up closer to the top, it's going to double again. And as we get closer to the top, it doubles again, right? So this is already kind of a smart uh, infill, but only with respect to the roof. All right, now I'm going to drop my version of uh, what, or my rendition of what Dr. Boyer did and uh, show you how that works. And I'll render this like he did with a very low infill density and uh, sh show you these little lines poking out. Okay, now if we scroll down here, we can stop that. Yeah, anyway, if we scroll down here, we can see here are the little, you know, tube cylindrical cuts that are inside. And since I have the, the color scheme set to line type, you can see the shell and the inner wall right there. And as I scroll up here, you can see the other lines, and that's obviously going to add uh, strength in that direction. So if this were the area that we were trying to reinforce, then obviously that's going to be a lot stiffer than the 20% infill, and you save yourself a lot of you know material and weight by just stiffening it where it's important. Now again, this would be something like he would do by taking this, modeling it in FEM, running it through the script that puts these little holes in it. I obviously put them in by hand, and then uh, running it through the slicer like this with no interaction between the slicer and the, the actual script. 
Now, let me do my little twist on it. So I'm gonna to try to simulate a smart infill by taking this cube that I that I uh, built up and I just put a single like oval shaped you know, elliptical slot through it, uh, through part of it, just so that that void right there could simulate the higher density area that would be picked up on by the FEM program and then translated to the slicer for the slicer to decide where the density of the infill should be higher. Now, again, right here, this is what it would look like with just the regular grid pattern. And there you can see the hole. Obviously, that's going to be a little bit stiffer. But if I use one of the um, 3D patterns with gradual infill steps supporting the roof, well, that bottom part right here, you can see it's going to treat it like the roof. And as I go up here, you see it subdivides and then subdivides again and then makes a very nice platform for the, you know, quote unquote roof, which is actually the bottom part of our channel that we drilled in there. Now, what I'm saying is a smart slicer would pick up on that without having to put a channel in there from the FEM program and then automatically make that subdivided three dimensional infill denser in that particular area. Just like these type of infill patterns already do as support for the roof right here, as you see that it subdivides and subdivides again and subdivides again. See what I'm saying? So what I would love to see is some kind of module or integrated FEA, uh, FIA or FEM type thing that would do that sort of analysis. It could be based on like a, a module that's taken from a, an open source FEM project like, um, Codaster or uh, Cast3M or Kratos, not Kratos the God of War, Kratos the software. Um, or even uh, I think FreeCAD might have a module or something like that. If some of that code can be taken, built into a nice stripped down module to just do this type of thing and built into a slicer. Or run as like a separate application that just has a helper import into like, you know, Cura and Slicer and things like that. And then you would be able to feed that information into the slicer that would then make the denser sections of infill, et cetera, et cetera. Now, like I said in the, in the video when I was showing you all the slicer settings, a lot of those capabilities are already in there, just not in this particular way. They're geared much toward making things look pretty. And that's one of the problems I kind of have with like the 3D technology is it seems to like a lot of the focus is torn are to, uh, toward like making things look pretty, make, making like little frog models print out nice and like, you know, the surface and the smoothest and things like that. Whereas I, I'm more interested as like a, a rapid and accurate prototyping type of a thing. So it it would be much better for those features rather than gaining density toward tops of like an overfill or like your, your uh, top shell to keep it from like sagging and looking cosmetically bad if that were geared toward, you know, like I said, adding density where you want it, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Hope the video gets the ball rolling in your head. And if you have some Python experience skills, a little bit of free time and some experience with FEM, maybe you could take a crack at it. This is all open source stuff that we're talking about. Anyway, Thanks a lot. Catch you in the next video. Until then, get out there and make something awesome.